While it's been around for years, the long putter has continually stirred a good bit of debate, specifically with anchoring. After a number of players found success with the putting method in the early 2010s, anchoring was ultimately banned in 2016. This controversial decision was met with mixed reactions, and its effects are still relevant today. Greetings y'all, it's your knock Peter Mata, and since I've talked about golfers, golf coaches, and golf companies already, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about golf rules. So without further ado, today we're going to get into the anchoring debate and what happened to the long putter. Our story begins in 1924 with unrenowned but legendary golfer Leo Deagle. In that year, Leo introduced us to the quote-unquote belly putter. Dubbed as deagling by other players, Leo developed a putting stance which involved a bent over, elbows out position with the butt of the putter at his belly button. Combining this putting form with his tremendous shot making ability, Leo went on to capture a couple PJ championships and double digit PJ tour wins. Jones said that he would probably rather watch him hit a ball than, than anybody. He said he's wondrous with his ball strike and he said, but his putting is something else and he's a very, very eccentric putter and he he tried all different ways to contort himself to try to get the ball in the hole. His elbows were way, way out. Way out. Moving to 1961, the belly putter got a more formal introduction when Richard Parley submitted the first patent for a belly putter, or as it was called then, the body pivot golf putter. Now, while his patent was later approved in 1965, Richard didn't bring his idea to the market like he originally planned. As he said, life got in the way and his patent ended up expiring a few years down the line. But that didn't stop the long putter from continuing to move forward. In 1966, Phil Rogers won twice on the PGA Tour with a 39 and a half inch belly putter. In addition, around this time, Sam Snead introduced his legendary croquet style putting. While Slam and Sammy didn't have outrageous success with it, the putting style certainly caught some eyes, especially from the USGA and RNA. And in 1968, the USGA and RNA ultimately decided to ban that style of putting with Rule 35-1. Joe Day, the then executive of the USGA, explained by saying, quote, We made the decision with great reluctance, but we felt it was the only way to eliminate the unconventional styles that have developed in putting. The game of golf was becoming bizarre. It was some other game, part croquet, part shuffleboard. This didn't completely deter Slam and Sam, as for the rest of his career, he ended up going to a side saddle putting style. However, I will say the governing body's ruling did set a bit of a precedent for how they would deal with things like this in the future. In the 1970s, Sam Torrance introduced his chin anchored putter, which helped him garner enormous success over his career. As we got to the 1980s, the long putter started to get used more and more. Charles Owens, who was battling the yips and bad knees, whipped out his famous 51-inch putter that he anchored to his chest. With the putter, which he nicknamed Slim Jim, he went on to win twice on the Champions Tour in 1986. In 1987, Johnny Miller won the AT&T Pebble Beach National Pro-Am using a 46-inch long putter, which he gripped by bracing against his left arm. Also worth noting is that Bernhard Langer went to a left-hand low version of this around this time, albeit with a shorter putter, and it eventually helped him capture his second green jacket. Moving to 1989, Orville Moody, who was previously known as one of the worst putters, ended up not only winning the US Senior Open, but he also became one of the better putters on the Champion Store after switching to the long putter. This opened back up the talks about the legality of the long putter and sparked discussions whether the club should be banned. After a couple months of debate, the USGA and RNA announced that the long putters would continue to be permitted under the rules of golf. David Fay, who was the USGA executive director at the time, explained that, quote, putting is a very individualized art form. To inhibit a golfer's individual style would take some of the fun out of the game. With that, the long putter show went on, and in 1991, at the Doral Open, Rocco Media became the first player to win a PGA Tour event using a long putter anchored to his chest. 
I will say during this time and throughout the 1990s, the long putter was still more common for older golfers or golfers like Rocco Mediate who had some sort of back or body issue that made it more comfortable to use the long putter. So the conventional putter and grip was still what was predominantly used. However, I guess you could say that changed throughout the 2000s. Moving to the year 2000 at the Sony Open, Paul Hazinger earned his first PGA Tour win in over 6 years using a belly putter. The putter ultimately helped him earn spots on the US President's Cup team and US Ryder Cup team. To quote him directly, he said referring to the belly putter, quote, I was instantly better. In 2003, a total of 8 PJ Tour events were captured by players using the long putter. Now 4 of which belonged to one player, that being Vijay Singh, but still chatter began opening up again about the legality of the long putter. After winning the Zerg Classic with an anchored belly putter, Steve Flesh said referring to the putter, quote, This is like cheating. The USGA and RNA did announce a new limit to the length of clubs layer that year, that limit being a maximum length of 48 inches on all clubs, except the putter for whatever reason. In 2004, VJ continued his run with the belly putter, as three of his nine PJ Tour wins that year came with the long stick. He even inspired others to use it. For instance, Trevor Emmelman, who was only 24 at that time, won on the European Tour only two weeks after switching to the belly putter. This seemed to be the beginning of the trend of younger players using the long putter. In 2007, a 27-year-old Sergio Garcia damn near became the first player to win a major with the belly putter at that year's Open Championship. In 2009, while he wasn't anchoring, Angel Cabrera did win the Masters with a 39-inch putter, using it like the counterbalance putters you see nowadays. In April 2011, USGA Executive Director Mike Davis provided a statement about the possible ban of the anchored putter. He said, quote, We don't see this as a big trend. It's not as if all the junior golfers out there are doing this. No one's even won a major using one of these things anchored to themselves. So we don't see this as something that is really detrimental to the game. Unfortunately for Mike, this quote didn't age too well. In August of that year at the PJ Championship, Keegan Bradley became the first player to win a major while anchoring with a belly putter. Later that month, Mike Davis did expand on his earlier statement saying, quote, To date, there's no evidence they are giving anybody an undue advantage. But could we become concerned someday? The answer is yes. The very next month, anchoring with a belly putter, Bill Haas won the Tour Championship and FedEx Cup. This also marked the fifth win by an anchor putter in seven weeks on tour, and in total seven different players won on tour that year while anchoring. The steam for long putters only picked up more in 2012. In May, Matt Kuchar won the Players' Championship using his putting style that we now know him for, that being a long putter brace against his forearm. In 2012 at the US Open, Whip Simpson became the second player to win a major using a belly putter. Then the very next month at the Open Championship, Ernie Hills became the third player to win using a belly putter. And the runner up was Adam Scott, who was using a broom handle putter himself. Overall, it was reported that 43 out of 156 players, that being 27%, were using a belly putter or a broom handle putter. In November of that year, some of you might remember Tiang Lang Wan. He won the Asian Pacific Amateur Championship with a belly putter. And with that, he earned an invitation to the 2013 Masters, where he became the youngest ever competitor in the event's history. I suppose this was the straw that broke the camel's back, because the very same month, the USGA and RNA announced a proposal to ban anchored strokes beginning January 1st, 2016. This obviously caused a stir in the debate, and many certainly let out their opinions, but we'll get more into this in a bit. Through the 2013 season, as the governing bodies debated, the long putter continued to strive. At the Masters in April, Adam Scott essentially completed the long putter slam as he became the fourth player to win a major while anchoring with the long putter. And with that, in the following month, the fate of anchoring with the long putter was decided. On May 21st, 2013, after a 90 day comment period, the governing bodies announced that Rule 14-1B would officially be enacted on January 1st, 2016. 
We're announcing today that acting through our respective independent decision-making processes, the USGA and the RNA have both now approved the adoption of Rule 14-1B. It will take effect as part of the rules of golf on 1st of January 2016 at the beginning of the next four-year rules cycle. It says we, we know that not everyone will agree with our final decision, but we do hope that the care and love for the game that all have expressed through their participation in this process will facilitate acceptance of Rule 14-1B when it takes effect. Golf is, is a single worldwide game of fun, skill, challenge, honor, and integrity, which is best served by adherence to a single set of worldwide rules. The PGA of America and PGA Tour were still opposed to the ruling after the initial announcement, and there was even talk of some players taking up litigation against it. However, all the opposition was eventually walked back, and the rule ended up being adopted as it was proposed. Of course, while many players who anchored continue to use the method until 2016, we've definitely seen a big transition to different forms of using the long putter since then. For instance, like Sam Snead before him and KJ Choi for a bit as well, Bryson DeChambeau at one point attempted the side saddling style before he eventually went to the Matt Kuchar style with the putter brace to his forearm. And the Matt Kuchar style has been a pretty common go-to for players who used to anchor. Webb Simpson and Keegan Bradley are good examples of players who eventually adjusted from anchoring to this style. We also have those who eventually went back to the broom handle putter, which is still allowed so long as it's not anchored. For instance, Bernhard Langer, Scott McCarron, and of course Adam Scott have all used the broom handle putter without anchoring it to their chest. And certainly, we also have had players who weren't able to adjust, and unfortunately, Many of their careers haven't been the same since the ban. Anyways, as you can see, the long putter is still around, just in different forms though. But as I said earlier, and as the title indicates, we're going to break down the anchoring debate further to see the different sides of it. So let's first hear the reasoning for the anchor ban by the governing bodies. These are Mike Davis and Peter Dawson's thoughts after announcing the ban. Welcome, and Peter Dawson, Chief Executive of the RNA. And Mike, I will start with you. Why did you decide to go in this direction? Rich, when you saw in the opening monologue, we've seen for decades that this has been a controversial issue. This has been some we've seen golfers that very much cared about this issue on both sides and that ultimately this is about clarifying an issue this is about you know taking one of the most fundamental things in golf which is really saying how do you make a stroke and we've done this before whether it's through not allowing billiards type strokes whether it's um, croquet style pushing scraping spooning shuffleboard this is something where if you think about it golf has been in existence for roughly 600 years centuries it's it's been about picking up a club with two hands away from your body and swinging it freely anchoring doesn't do that it, it, it takes um, some stability out of the swing the players not controlling the whole club so ultimately you know while this has been around for the last three or so decades it has gotten to the point now and we can certainly talk about the why now part where we feel that in the best interest of the game long term we need to make a move and that's why we've done so you know Peter that is a big question that's being raised raised around the world of golf. Why after all these years, why now? Well, truthfully, it's the, the masses up, massive upsurge in usage of anchored strokes, both at top level in the game uh, and at recreational level. And that, that has really accelerated in the last two, th two to three years, which has brought this whole subject uh, right up our list of priorities. We, we, we became very concerned that we were going to see anchored strokes supplant, completely supplant potentially, the traditional putting stroke. And as governing bodies, we felt it was time to, 
to define uh, a golf stroke more more uh, clearly for everyone and that's what we've done today and taken hopefully the speculation out of the situation. Peter, how much, if at all, did the recent major championship winners, uh, successful with that anchored putter, how much did that factor into the decision? Well, I can be entirely honest in it. This is not a matter of who's won majors and who hasn't won majors. It's been entirely based on the upsurge, as I say, in the use of these uh, of these of, of these anchored strokes uh, all across the game. And uh, I guess it's inevitable that some majors would be won just on a on but, a percentage. But basis. it got your attention. It got our attention. But to be honest, it wasn't a, it wasn't a tipping point. There were also some players who were pro anchor ban and had other solutions for the debate. For instance. Here's what Tiger had to say back in 2012. I've never been a fan of it. Uh, I believe it's the art of controlling the body and, and club and swing, uh, the pendulum motion. I believe that's how it should be played. Um, I'm a traditionalist when it comes to that. My, my idea was to have it so that the putter would be equal to or less than the shortest club in your bag. You can still anchor the putter like Bernard Langer did, you know, against the form. Um, but still, that's still the art of swinging the club, too, at the same time. But I think you can get away from the, the belly or the long putter by that type of wording, whether or not they, they do it or not. And the Peters looked into it for a number of years trying to get it to work. Um, and do you actually measure everybody's sandwich and powder before you go out and play? Uh, that's another thing, too. In addition, there were some like Gary Player who called for bifurcation. And that's still talked about today with the most recent distance debate. Now let's hear the side of the players who were pro-anchoring and basically just said leave the rules alone. Here's Adam Scott's response to Tiger and some other thoughts. Opinion would be that I don't think it's probably in the best interest of the game to ban the long putter and that I think there are some more important issues that probably should uh, have time spent on them than putting. When Tiger Woods speaks about something, it generates a lot of interest, but uh, I'm not necessarily sure his views on what the putter should be are correct at all. I mean, I don't think that the putter, his views of the putter should be the shortest club in the bag. There's never been a rule of golf, so I don't know why it should be now either. So let's get into this debate, and really, I don't even know if there's a definitive right or wrong answer, but I'll give my two cents for what it's worth. To me, I understand the gripes on both sides. But first off, with those players who used the anchoring method, I don't think it can be denied that anchoring and using the long putter helped their putting. Hell, some of them even admit it. I mentioned Paul Azinger and Steve Flesh's comments earlier. I believe Ernie Els had similar comments too, and there are others who say the same thing. So with that, I can understand where the pro anchor van folks are coming from. As I mentioned earlier, it was no longer just older players or players with conditions that were going to it. By the early 2010s, young players and amateurs were starting to go to it as a first option, which understandably makes traditionalists worried about where the game and its rules are headed. But what I think is an underrated factor is that the governing bodies had a set precedent with the Sam Snead croquet putting case. Since they had that pass ruling in their back pocket, I really think that gave the governing bodies comfort to go through with the ban. If there was no precedent set, I'd be hard pressed to say that Mike Davis and Peter Dawson might have ruled differently. For me, ultimately, I will say I personally lean toward those players who anchored. Look, I, I too don't like that young players and amateurs were going to it as a first option. If you're able, you should try to putt conventional when you're first learning. But I do have to agree more with the David Fay statement I read earlier. I think part of what makes golf fun is that not everyone has a conventional swing or stroke. Everyone has a unique swing and stroke, and having the long putter and anchoring in the picture sort of feeds into the creativity golfers can have. While well, yes, there was a number of people picking up golf and using the method, those people were still very much in the minority. And it's not like anchoring made it automatic either. It's not like you just line up the club and it'll hit in the hole for you. I personally have struggled with the old yippee doodles 
and I've tried anchoring both the belly and chest putters. It helps no doubt, but it wasn't a cure-all. I eventually went to different methods that were more comfortable for me. So it still takes a certain level of skill to use the anchor method. You still have to read the putt and stroke it into the hole. And I can also tell you, the data definitely doesn't show that players were automatically going from worst to first in strokes game putting. At the end of the day, I just think it was a comfort move for the governing body since they had that precedent set. I get anchoring might not look good optically, and I get it's their job to define the rules of the game, but I thought they should have just left it alone. I think where a lot of people get peeved with the governing bodies is their timing with these things. It always seems reactive and especially to whatever is going on in the current times. As I mentioned earlier, you hear a lot of chatter with this distance debate now. I mean, I know it's been talked about before, but it's only heightened because of what Bryson DeChambeau has done in the last 18 months. It's pretty much heightening up like the anchor debate before. As soon as some players do well with it, they have to give it a look. Which honestly, is kind of frustrating to me. It's not like these players were winning everything and it's not like Bryson for instance has been winning everything, at least not yet. It still took hard work and skill for these players to win. In terms of solutions like bifurcation, I think that's just overcomplicating things. I personally love the fact that we amateurs are under the same rules as the pros. You know, I can't simulate running the football in the Super Bowl. I can't simulate dunking on another human being in the finals. I can't simulate hitting a, against an ace pitcher in the bottom of the ninth in the World Series. But what I can do is play the same course under the same rules and conditions as the pros and see how my game stacks up. And more than likely, it'll probably show that I have a ways to go to get to their level. But to me, that's part of the beauty of golf. Plus, that's pretty much why we have the handicap system anyways. So that's why I don't think bifurcation is the answer. To me, the answer is giving players more choice on how they want to play this game. There are enough mind-boggling rules in this game as is, so I say, let creativity reign. Of course, no doubt there still should be rules. I mean, I don't mind regulating driver CC limits or grooves or ball size, because in the end, the main rule remains to put the ball in the hole in the least number of shots. And trust me, that's hard enough to do no matter how you do it. Anyways, sorry if this sounds like a rant. As I keep saying in these videos, these are just my thoughts and opinions. I know there's differing ones out there, and honestly, I definitely would like to hear them. So what do y'all think? Should anchoring still be allowed? Should the governing bodies do anything about the distance debate? And overall, how should the governing bodies rule the game in general? Thanks again for watching y'all, and as always, please like, subscribe, and comment below. Your words mean something to me.